Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you to our 10th session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Furqan which is the 35th chapter in the Quran in its sequential order in its chronological order as we've mentioned uh, it is a, uh, a middle Meccan surah it was revere, revered, uh, revealed during the, uh, the middle Meccan period uh, as the Prophet is beginning to face uh, opposition and hostility from, uh, from the Meccans. Alhamdulillah, we, we've reached uh, verse number 31, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-ladhi awhayna ilayka min al-kitab bihuwa al-haqq musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh, and that which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, of the book is the truth, confirming what was before it. Indeed, God of his servants is acquainted and seeing. Of course, what was revealed to the Prophet, the book, here is a reference, according to the majority opinion, is the Qur'an. There are many verses throughout the Qur'an that, re- that refer to the Qur'an as Al-Kitab. Now, some, some scholars have argued that, and that which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, of the book, meaning some have understood the book to mean al al mahfuv the preserved tablet, because... Revelation, in essence, is a process whereby those sublime concepts and ideas are simplified and, uh, and brought down to these lower worlds, and this is where they take on the form of, uh, of language. But again, looking at the context, the, uh, the book most likely is a reference uh, to the Qur'an. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this book, which is a beacon of guidance, which we have revealed to the Prophet, one of the unique qualities of this book is that it confirms what was before it. Now the Qur'an is the final testament of God. There is no more revelation after the Qur'an. What does it mean when Allah says, that the Qur'an confirms what is before it. Now, of course, we know that the Torah and the Injil were distorted. They were adulterated. And the Torah and the Injil that existed with Christians and Jews during the time of the Prophet was not that pure message that was revealed to Musa and Isa السلام, there were certain changes that were made to the scriptures. You know, religious clerics, unfortunately, you know, because of worldly interests, they manipulated the texts, the scriptures. So what does it mean when the Quran says that it confirms what was in the previous scriptures? Now, of course, there are many verses. There are many verses in the Quran that convey this idea that the Qur'an confirms what is written in the Torah and in the Injil and in the ancient scriptures. So for instance, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 41, Allah says, وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ And believe, and here Allah is speaking of course to uh, the Jews in Medina, and believe in what I have sent down Confirming that which is already with you. And do not be the first to disbelieve, disbelieve in it. Meaning Allah is saying that to the to the Israelites that you should be the foremost in believing because you have extra evidence that the pagan worshippers don't have, meaning that you have scriptural prophecies of the, the coming of the final prophet. So you should be the first ones to support him. And 
And do not exchange my signs for a small price. Now, what does this mean? Now, some of the, the rabbis, some of the Jewish scholars in Medina, one of the reasons why they were hesitant to accept and to believe in the Prophet it was really for, for a few reasons. Among them was that number one, he was a Gentile, that the Prophet was not a Jew, and the, 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 the Israelites were unwilling to follow a non-Jewish prophet, you know, because they, many of them were very prejudiced and, and nationalistic and, and really xenophobic. So they saw the prophet as an outsider that we reject, you know, this, and this is one of the meanings of an Nabi al-Ummi, because even the, because the Jews used to refer to non-Jews, to Gentiles as Ummiyin, as, um, as those who are not Jewish, Gentiles. So this was one reason, the fact that Rasulullah was not from the line of Ishaq. Secondly, the Jews had become very wealthy in, in Medina, and especially the rabbis, you know, many of the, the scholars, they enjoyed some perks. And one of the perks of being a religious cleric is that, you know, people give you religious alms and some of these scholars used to have financial, they used to enjoy financial advantages because of their religious positions. So they were afraid that if we recognize Muhammad as the messenger of God, these religious dues, which our religious communities are given to us, we would have to hand them over to the Prophet. So Allah is calling these material interests that they have which are preventing them from accepting Rasulullah, Allah says, this is something so insignificant. Do not exchange my signs, the signs of the truth, for a small price, for some money that you're going to earn in dunya as a result of maintaining your position as a religious leader. And do not exchange my signs for a small price and fear only me. So here the point is, that Allah is telling the Bani Israel in Medina and believe in what I have sent down, confirming that which is already with you. And there are many verses like this, uh, especially within Surah Al-Baqarah. If you look at verse number 89, again, another instance of the Quran confirming what is mentioned in the scriptures, the, the scriptures of the past, the heavenly scriptures. Allah, again, is speaking about the Jews, Bani Israel. And when there came to them a book from God, confirming that which, that which was with them, so the Jews, according to this verse, what they used to do is, although before they used to pray for victory against those who disbelieved. So whenever they faced harassment or persecution from the idol worshippers, they would say to them, that God is going to give us victory over you through the final messenger. And this is one of the reasons why some of the Jewish tribes had settled in Arabia, because they knew that the final messenger of God would appear in these lands. And so they were awaiting him. They were, they were essentially waiting for the vuhur of the final prophet, in the same way that you and I are awaiting the zuhur, the reappearance of the 12th Imam. So they used to actually, the, the prophet was there, uh, they drew a lot of hope and inspiration from this belief in the final messenger. And it, it's what used to give them confidence over uh, the disbelievers. They used to say that, you know, victory is near when the final messenger of God appears in these lands we will we will have the uh, the upper hand but then 
when there came to them that which they recognized. So there were certain signs in the final messenger of God that they knew they disbelieved in it. They rejected him because of because he was a Gentile, because they knew that they would lose many of their uh, material advantages. So the curse of God will be upon the disbelievers. And one more, one more ayah, just to give you a sense of how well acquainted they were with the descriptions of the final prophet. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ those to whom we gave the scripture, those to whom we gave the scripture know him, him meaning Rasulullah. They know him as they know their own sons or their own children. But indeed, but indeed, a party of them conceal the truth while they know it. Now, they're able to conceal the truth is because there are many Israelites who are, who are not able to read and write. So they depend on the rabbis and these religious scholars, scholars of the Torah, to, to teach them. And therefore you find that many of them concealed what was recorded in their scriptures because of you know uh, some worldly uh, gains. So... The Quran, if we go back to the verse, and that which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, of the book is the truth. The Quran is the absolute truth because it is emanating from the Creator. The, the controversies surrounding the, the, the crucifixion are, you know, what, what the Quran mentions. What happened to Jesus, the details surrounding the story of, of Musa and Nuh, all of it. This is the truth. And when it says it confirms what was before it, it doesn't mean that the Quran confirms the false beliefs that are mentioned in the previous scriptures that happened as a result of tampering and distortion. But rather, the Quran confirms what was before it mainly the fact that Muhammad is the final messenger of God. And there are many things in the Qur'an that can be corroborated by, by uh, the Torah and in, in the Injil, which is further evidence uh, against uh, the people of the book. And it, and it serves as uh, uh, you know, more reason for them to, uh, to accept the Prophet as the final messenger. Verse number 32. Then we caused to inherit the book. Now this is why Though, though the ulama who argue that the book here is Allah al-Mahfuz, it doesn't make sense looking at the context because the preserved tablet is not what has is not what is being inherited by others. It's the Quran. So then we cause to inherit the book. Then we cause to inherit the book. Who inherited the book? Those who we have chosen of our servants. So here we'll speak about this shortly. This idea that the Quran, there's no prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa But there are those, so the prophet receives the Quran. Who inherits the Quran after the prophet? Who inherits the understanding of the Quran after the prophet? So then we caused to inherit the book, those who have chosen, who, those who, we have those we have chosen of our servants. And among them, meaning among our servants, is he who wrongs himself. And among them is he who is moderate or he who takes the middle way. And among them is he who is foremost in good deeds by permission of God. That 
that is what is the great bounty. Now, who inherited the Quran? The Quran very explicitly says, Thumma, you know, after we revealed the Quran, and this this thumma means after, so after the revelation of the Quran to the Prophet. Allah speaks about this new process of wiratha, the process of inheriting what was revealed to the Prophet. Thumma awrathna al kitab. Who inherited the Qur'an? Who inherited what was revealed to the Prophet? Anyone? الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا In the same way that Allah chose prophets to receive revelation, Allah has also chosen certain individuals to inherit the full understanding of those scriptures. So with respect to the Qur'an, we then we cause to inherit the book, meaning the Quran, those who we who we have chosen of our servants. Now, who inherited the Quran? If you look at the the tafasir, there are you'll see a plethora of different opinions and viewpoints. Now, some, if you look at the the commentaries of our brothers and sisters of Ahl Sunnah. They say that, some of them say that this refers to the prophets, of course, but this is a problematic opinion because if we concede that book here mean, means the Qur'an, there are no prophets after, the, after Rasulullah to, for someone to say that the prophets inherit the Qur'an. That's obvious. The prophets receive the Qur'an and there might be some prophets in the past who were, who were the successors of those prophets who, who inherited the book. But after Rasulullah, there are no prophets. So there, have, there has to be a group of people who are not prophets, but who are chosen by God to inherit the, the Quran. In any case, some, some have said from Ahl Sunnah that those who inherited the Quran are the scholars and they say that and they point to certain ahadith where they say many ahadith speak about this idea of how the ulama al ulama warathatul anbiya that scholars are the inheritors of the prophets and since the prophets were recipients of revelation scholars inherit that legacy of knowledge so that's that's a second opinion. But the problem is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we have chosen of our servants, that those who inherit the book, Allah says, we caused to inherit the book those whom we have chosen of our servants. So the question is. Who are these scholars? If you say that it's just your average Muslim scholar, can anyone say that they have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when many of them have contradictory, contradictory opinions? In any case, that's, that's one opinion. That's another opinion. There are some who have said that those who have inherited the Qur'an the ones who have inherited the Qur'an, it refers to the entire Muslim community. And therefore the Ummah of Rasulullah has inherited the Qur'an. And they refer to this verse as a sort of supporting evidence for their claim. Surah 40, ayah number 53. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَ الْهُدَى and we had certainly given Moses guidance in the form of the Torah. And of course, the Torah is the, the most important guidance that was given to Musa. And we caused the children of Israel to inherit the book. So the idea here is that the Muslims, the Ummah of Rasulullah inherited the Qur'an 
in the same way that the Israelites inherited the Torah. Now the problem with this, this opinion is there are many within the ranks of the Israelites who didn't really inherit. They didn't even practice the Torah. So what does it mean to inherit? Does it just mean that the Quran exists among, among us? To inherit the Quran. If you think about inheritance in general, if someone, if I pass away and my offspring inherit my wealth, what does that mean? That they receive it and they benefit from it. They use it. So if someone has no connection to the Torah, can they be called those who inherited the Torah? In fact, if you look at Surah Al-Jumu'ah, ayah number five, Allah mentions that there are many people among Bani Israel who did not carry the Torah. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّورَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارًا The example of those who were entrusted with the Torah and then did not take it on. They did not take it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens them to donkeys with, their, with books on their backs. So we call, when Allah says, and we cause the children of Israel to inherit the book, it doesn't mean the entire uh, community of Musa. This is referring to the awsiya of Musa, the successors of Musa who inherited the knowledge of the Torah that was given to Musa. Because Allah explicitly says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا They did not take it on. They did not carry it. it. They were entrusted with it, but they did not carry it. Now, according to the, the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt, alayhimu salatu wassalam, the meaning of this verse, the meaning of this, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا where Allah says, we cause to inherit the book those we have chosen of our servants. We have narrations, for example, from Imam al-Baqir, where he says, those who are chosen to inherit the Qur'an. Imam al-Baqir says, here, this verse, here, fi wuldi aliyin wa fatima, that this verse was revealed about the progeny of Ali and Fatima. That th these people, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they are the ones who inherited the meaning of the Quran. They are the inheritors of the Quran. In fact, in many of the ziyarat, we we refer to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt as the inheritors, not only of the Quran. They're inheritors of the, the, the prophetic knowledge from the time of Adam to the Holy Prophet. In Ziyarat Warith, we say, Assalamu alayka to Imam al Hussein, Assalamu alayka ya waritha, Adama Safwatillah. Imam al Hussein is the inheritor of, of Adam. They, are, they received this, this divine, this prophetic knowledge. In, a, in another tradition, just to give you an idea of how many narrations we have from the Ahlul Bayt, where they explicitly say that we, the Ahlul Bayt, are the ones who inherited the Qur'an. Someone who doesn't know and doesn't understand the ambiguous verses in the Qur'an, because the Qur'an contains muhkam verses, decisive verses, and mutashabih verses. Who has access to the ambiguous verses. Who has knowledge of the deep meanings of the Quran? So to inherit means that you are, this whoever is inheriting the Quran is receiving the Prophet's understanding of the Quran. وعن الكاظم عليه السلام Hadith is from Imam Al-Kaظم أنه تلا هذه الآية Imam Al-Kadhim, when he recited this verse that we're looking at, قَالَ فَنَحْنُ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَانَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَزَّ وَجَدْ He says, we are the ones who have been chosen by God. وَأَوْرَثْنَا هَذَا الْكِتَابِ 
And Allah has made us inherit this book. Which contains an explanation of everything. Now, if we go back to the verse, then we cause to inherit the book those who have those we have chosen of our servants. And then Allah speaks about three different groups of people. And among them, among the servants of God, so Allah has chosen some from among his servants to be inheritors. And among the servants of God, so the ayah is not saying that among those who were chosen, it's saying that it's not speaking about those who, are, who have inherited the book. Among the servants of God is he who wrongs himself, number one. And among them is he who is moderate, number two. And among them is he who is foremost in good deeds by permission of God. That is the great bounty. Now, so the verse then lists three types of people. Those who wrong themselves. Those who take the middle course or those who are moderate. And those who are foremost in good deeds. Now, if you look at the Sunni perspective, if you look at the tafasir of our Sunni brothers and sisters, you see that the three types of people listed here refer to three categories of mu'mineen, three categories of believers. So the first is فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ The first is those who wrong themselves. So according to the Sunni perspective, of course, there's a lot of diversity among, among Sunni commentaries, but this is one of the, the main opinions. Those who wrong themselves are believers. So all three groups are, are Muslims, they're mu'mineen. Those who wrong themselves are the believers who are careless. You know, you have some people who are Muslim and they pray some days and then they don't pray. And then they they might forget some, they might omit some of their wajibat, they partake in some of the muharramat. This is فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ Those who wrong themselves. وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ Those who take a middle course or moderate are those who perform their wajibat but they neglect praiseworthy deeds and they might do some things that are disliked by Allah they might do some of the makruhat but they're mediocre meaning they don't go above and beyond the basics they do their wajibat they generally avoid the muharramat these are the moderate and then you have a third those who are foremost in good deeds. So these are the people who do their wajibat, they avoid the muharramat, and they go above and beyond. They do the recommended acts of worship. They go above and beyond, and they even make an effort to avoid what is disliked by God. So even if something is not haram, but if it's disliked, they refrain from it. So they're the foremost in doing good deeds. Now, now, so based on this perspective, you know, the, many Sunni scholars, they say that the Qur'an was inherited by those who have been chosen by God. And those who have been chosen by God refers to the Ummah, the Muslim community. And even those who believe yet wrong themselves will, will be forgiven. So... فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ All of them will inshallah re receive the forgiveness of God. And this is actually, and, but, but there are some Sunni commentators who say فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ refers to disbelievers. And وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They refer to the believers. So 
there's there's a little bit of a difference of opinion. So those who believe that the Quran was inherited by those who have been chosen by God, and those who are chosen by God are the are, is the entire Ummah. They say all three groups are mu'mineen and all of them will eventually end up in paradise. They'll be forgiven. Another interpretation that we find among Ahlul Sunnah is that فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ refers to the disbelievers, the hypocrites. And the and the, the other two refer to mu'mineen. And therefore they say this is an allusion to the three groups which Surah Al-Waqi'a mentions. You know, on the Day of Judgment, you have Ashab al-Shimal, Ashab al-Yameen, and As-Sabiqoon as-Sabiqoon, the foremost of the foremost. So they say that this verse mirrors those three groups because Allah will group people into three major groups on the Day of Judgment. Ashab al-Shimal, Ashab al-Yameen, and As-Sabiqoon, As-Sabiqoon. Now, now, what is the Shi'i perspective? Now, as we mentioned, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have indicated that they are the ones who have inherited the book. They are the ones who have inherited the understanding, the full understanding of the Quran. Because Rasulullah had full understanding of the Quran. And this Quran, Allah says, we made. That we made those whom we have chosen inherit, inherit the book. Now what type of inheritance is this if they only inherit a part of the, uh, the understanding of the Quran? Allah says we made them inherit the book, which means the, the, the book in its, its entire understanding. So according to the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt inherited the Qur'an, the meaning of the Qur'an. And the three groups that are mentioned all relate and all relate to people's relationship with those who have inherited the Qur'an. And it makes a lot of sense that this Grouping of people is not arbitrary. People are grouped based on their relationship with those who have been chosen by God to inherit the Quran. And one of those three is, is the Imam, of, Imam himself. So you have a narration which is mentioned in Al Kafi. So Al Kafi from Sheikh Al Kulaini narrates his chain all the way back to Imam al-Baqir. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, our fifth Imam, قال السابق بالخيرات الإمام When Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Let me go back to the verse. Imam begins with the foremost. And among them is he who is foremost in good deeds. By permission of God. So this gives you a hint that these, those who are foremost in good deeds by permission of God, it indicates that they have a special relationship with Allah that doesn't exist with the other two. Now we go back to the, the hadith. The foremost in good deeds is the Imam. Because the Imam always knows what is good. He doesn't have to rely on anyone else to, to tell him what is good. He is the foremost in good because he's the role model, because he's the example, because he has full, because he has inherited knowledge of the Quran and he knows what is permissible and what is forbidden. Even when other scholars might be arguing about what the Islamic position is, the Imam is sabiqun bil khayrat. He's the foremost in good because he always knows what is good. Because he has inherited knowledge of the book. Qal as bil khayrat al-imam. The foremost in good deeds is the Imam. Wal-muqtasid al-arif lil-imam. And those 
who take the middle course are the ones who know the Imam. They have ma'rifah of the Imam. وَالظَّالِمُ لِنَفْسِهِ الَّذِي لَا يَعْرِفُ الْإِمَامِ And the one who wrongs himself is the one who does not know the Imam or does not know the stature and the position of the Imam. Shaykh Al-Tabrasi in Majma' Al-Bayan, he cites a hadith and uh, Tafsir Majma' Al-Bayan was the most prominent and most important tafsir of the Qur'an before uh, Allama Tabatabai published Tafsir Al-Mizan. And Majma' Al-Bayan is still a very valuable reference for uh, tafsir. In any case, Shaykh Al-Tabrasi, he cites a hadith from Imam Sadiq where the Imam again explains these three groups. وَفِي الْمَجْمَعِ عَنْهُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ أَظَّالِمُ لِنَفْسِهِ مِنَّا So here the Imam is saying that these three groups are all mu'mineen. They're all followers of Ahlul Bayt. But they have different degrees. أَظَّالِلُ لِنَفْسِهِ مِنَّا مَنْ لَا يَعْرِفُ حَقَّ الْإِمَامِ There are some mu'mineen who don't know the right of the Imam. They might believe in the Imam, but they don't. They haven't understood the status and the right and the position of the Imam. لا يعرف حق الإمام. That's the one who has wronged himself. Because when you don't, when you don't know the right of the Imam, when you don't have ma'rif of the Imam, you deprive yourself of guidance. والمقتصد منا من يعرف حق الإمام. The one who wrongs himself is from us, our followers, and does not know the right of the Imam. And the moderate one knows the right of the Imam. وَالسَّابِقُ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ هُوَ imam, And of course, the foremost in good deeds is the Imam himself. وَهَاُولَا كُلُّهُمْ مَغْفُورٌ لَهُمْ And all of them will be forgiven. Meaning that if someone has a proper belief system, even if they end up making mistakes, they may be punished. You know, they might suffer when they're on their deathbed. They, Allah might punish them in their graves. They may be punished in Alamul Barzakh. They may suffer greatly on the day of judgment, but eventually they will be admitted into paradise. This is the importance of having a proper aqidah. So, so they are all forgiven in the end because they submitted to the truth. Even though they may have failed in applying what they knew, but because they their hearts accepted the truth, they didn't turn away from it arrogantly. Eventually, they will be given the they will be forgiven. But this doesn't mean that you know just because you believe in the wilayah of Ahlul Bayt, you just do whatever you want and you die and then you go to Jannah. No, there might there, there may be great suffering that that uh, that takes place after death. The Imam salam, says, these three groups are all essentially mu'mineen. Of course, the Imam is the Imam of the, the mu'mineen and the mutsaqeen. But the other two, you have the pious and the not so pious. Even the not so pious, they may go through a, a, type, a, a process of purification after death. But eventually Allah in His infinite mercy will, will pardon them. Now, when it comes to the way that these groups will be treated on the Day of Judgment. Majma, again, in Majma' al-Bayan, there is a narration from the Prophet. sabiq. So there's, here's another interpretation of the, uh, the verse. Hisab. As for the foremost in good deeds, they shall enter paradise without reckoning. And of course, the Imams, they enter paradise without Hisab, without reckoning. So this could be also understood as uh, being the Imam. As for the moderate ones, those who knew the Imams and they lived righteous lives, they will be given an easy reckoning. Even if they had certain sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be 
will be uh, he will make the the accounting very easy for them. As for the one who wronged himself, As for the one who wronged himself, they shall be imprisoned in their place. They stand on the day of judgment. They have to go through that long, agonizing process. And then, after some time, they are made to enter paradise. So you here you see a theme. And that theme in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt is that those who have, who have inherited the Qur'an, who have inherited the meaning and the understanding of the Qur'an are the Ahlul Bayt. And the three groups that are mentioned in this ayah, of course, one of them is the Imam, and the Muqtasid, the moderate ones, are the ones who know the Imams and they act accordingly. And those who who don't know the status of the imams of Ahlul Bayt, they were ignorant, they had not developed a strong relationship with them, they will suffer as a result of their carelessness. But because they accepted the belief, they recognized that these imams are my leaders and they're chosen by God, because they didn't really act in accordance with that belief, they will face uh, difficulties. So this shows you that having belief in and of itself has, has value. Now, of course, it has to be a true belief. They really believed in the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, but they, you know, they made mistakes. They had their, had their shortcomings. And if we go back to the verse, the verse ends with, ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْكَبِيرُ That is what is the great bounty. Now, what is that referring to? Because this is ism ishara, it's a demonstrative uh, pro, uh, noun, pronoun. So what is it referring back to? Some say that it refers to those who are the foremost in good deeds, meaning to be an imam, this is a great bounty of Allah upon you. Or it could mean that that is the great bounty. It could mean that Inheriting the, the Qur'an is a great ni'mah. But another, another possibility is that is a great bounty. And what is this great bounty? Allah explains what this great bounty is in the next verse. That it's a great bounty to be an, an inheritor of the book or to be to know those who have inherited the book because the reward is immense. The, the reward is paradise. Verse number 33. Gardens of Eden which they will enter. Adorned therein with bracelets of gold and pearls. And their garments therein will be of silk. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sheds light on the way in which the believers are honored when they enter paradise. They enter it and they're adorned with bracelets of gold and pearls. So they're adorned with the finest jewelry and clothing. And of course the, the jewelry and the clothing in paradise is nothing that we can we can imagine. Meaning that even if someone says that Sheikh, I'm not a materialistic uh, person, and therefore these things are not important to me. The the jewelry and the clothing, it it also has a spiritual dimension in paradise. That this is just not, it's not just material things, because paradise is a heavenly environment, and this is. This is Allah honoring you. It's very different from you know wearing fine clothing and jewelry and dunya. It's a totally different experience. And we find that, of course, there are different levels in paradise. And even if someone is in the company of others in paradise, it doesn't necessarily mean that they occupy the same status before God. So you could be sitting together with, with a group, but it doesn't mean that you are you have an equal rank before God. In the same way that sometimes a king 
is sitting and he has his aides who are sitting around him. Now, just because they're sitting together, it doesn't mean that they have the same status. So paradise is not an egalitarian environment. It's not a place where everyone is, is equal. There are people who hold higher statuses than, than others. But what makes Jannah different from Dunya is that in Dunya, you have this element of, of enmity and jealousy. And jealousy. People are typically jealous of those who are higher than them. And those who are higher than them typically have contempt and they belittle those who are below them. But this is paradise. Where there's no, there's nothing but mutual love and respect and mercy between all mu'mineen of, of different, uh, different uh, ranks. So even, so the mu'mineen who are at the highest ranks, they look at those who are below them with mercy. Not with contempt. They're, they don't look at them with condescending eyes. And those who look up, who, the, who, those who see those, the believers who see and meet with those who are of higher ranks, they don't feel jealous of them. They know that this is, uh, God has elevated them. And they look at them with reverence and with respect. So it's a very different uh, environment. And of course, whether you are in the lowest levels of Jannah or the highest levels of Jannah, all of all of the mu'minin are adorned and they're treated with, with respect and honor. And it's interesting that some, some scholars have noted that the inhabitants, so this verse speaks about bracelets of gold and pearls. And we know that you know gold uh, has typically has more value than silver. So some, and again, I don't know how accurate this opinion is, but this is something that has been uh, presented. And that's the idea that, you know, when Allah speaks about adorning with, with silver and gold, this could be an indication of difference in status. And they are adorned with silver bracelets. Some are adorned with, with, uh, with gold, but this could also just mean it could be a reference to the diversity of the the jewelry that's uh, in paradise, because after all, you know this is Surat al Insan, and we know that Surat al Insan was was revealed in honor of Ahlul Bayt, and of course they occupy the highest degrees in paradise. And if we go back to the verse, so they they are adorned with uh, with bracelets of of gold and pearls. And their garments therein will be of, of silk. Now, of course, silk in 7th century Arabia was seen as, you know, the finest clothes. And it was very soft. You know, most of the Arabs used to wear very coarse and rough clothing because they had to, because it was the desert. But you see that here, you know, this could be conveying the idea that, that in, in paradise, not only are the believers adorned with the finest, the most luxurious clothing, the most regal clothing, but it's also very comfortable. So everything about paradise is comfortable. The weather is comfortable. The, uh, the jewelry is comfortable. The clothes are comfortable. The company, the people are comfortable. So this is, this is a place that is, is tailored to the comfort and the, uh, the enjoyment of, uh, of mu'mineen. In Surah, Surah Al-Kahf, verse 31, Allah says, And they will wear green garments of fine silk and brocade. And I've actually written an, an entire book on this subject, the Grand Tour Quranic Descriptions of Paradise, where I speak about the material and the spiritual blessings of paradise. So you can check that out if you want, if you want to go in, into more depth. وقالوا, verse number 34 وقالوا, شكور, and they will say praise be to God who has dispelled grief from us truly our Lord is forgiving and thankful there's a hadith from the prophet that says that this statement will be uttered by a certain group of people in Jannah. So if you go, if you recall, the verse number 32 mentioned three groups of people. 
فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِ The one who wrongs himself, the one who takes the middle course, and the one who is the foremost in good deeds. So according to the Prophet, this, this will be expressed, this expression of gratitude to God for removing grief from, from their hearts, this is what those who wrong themselves and enter Jannah will, this is their dua. The Prophet says, وَأَمَّا الظَّالِمُ لِنَفْسِ فَيُحْبَسُ فِي الْمَقَامِ ثُمَّ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّ الْحَزَنِ So it is reported that the Prophet said, as for the one who wrongs himself, he will be afflicted with distress and sorrow in that state. So there are mu'mineen who will stand, they will, they will, be, they will be held on the Day of Judgment. And because they're held up, and they're not admitted into paradise early like the rest, they will feel a lot of anxiety, a lot of grief. And of course, when they enter Jannah, that, that anxiety, that stress that they experienced will be removed from their hearts. And when Allah removes that grief and that, you know, you know we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, people feel that when they, when they experience some small world, worldly calamities, Imagine the PTSD of, after you go through a rigorous hisab of Yom Al-Qiyamah. So Allah removes that, that trauma or that stress or that distress or that grief. And these believers, when they enter, after that very challenging, very distressing experience of the Day of Judgment, they raise their hands and they thank Allah. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّ الْحَزَنَ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا Truly our Lord is forgiving because he forgave them and uh, he's shakur, meaning that he, he appreciated even the little, the, the small good deeds that we did. And then this is again a, a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِي أَحَلَّنَا دَارَ الْمُقَامَةِ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ لَا يَمَسُّنَا فِيهَا نَصَبٌ وَلَا يَمَسُّنَا فِيهَا لُغُوبٌ who of his bounty has caused us to dwell in the abode of everlasting life. Dar al-Muqama. Dar al-Muqama, this is a place that doesn't end. You will never be asked to leave. There is no evictions from paradise. This is the abode of everlasting life. There is no aging. There is no sickness. This is where, where you will enjoy for all of eternity and you will never get bored so people enter so allah says الذي احلنا دار المقامه من فضله and of course all of us we enter paradise because of the grace of god because of his mercy and because no one is entitled to uh, to jannah we, we're not even entitled to exist let alone to exist and be given reward and then they say, La yamassuna. One of the one of the, the great qualities of paradise, the unique features of paradise is, is that there is no nasab and there is no lughub, meaning no fatigue, no weariness shall touch us, nor fatigue befall us. So nasab and lughub, they're similar. You know, some have said that nasab is the, the work and the toil that brings out fatigue and weariness. So, so basically, nasab is, is to toil, and lughub is that feeling of, uh, of exhaustion and fatigue. Others have said that nasab it refers to this idea of having to work for a living. You know, one of, in, 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 in this earthly life, we have to work to provide for ourselves. We have to work to provide shelter and food and other other basic necessities, whereas in Jannah, that is all provided for us. There is no nasab. We don't have to work to earn a living in paradise. A very comfortable life is granted to us. We are served in paradise. And there's no lughub, there's no weariness or, or any feelings of exhaustion. And some, some mufassirin have said that nasab refers to the, the exhaustion of the body, fatigue of the body, whereas lughub refers to the, the weariness of the soul or the spirit. You know, sometimes you might physically be rested, but, but mentally you're tired, you're exhausted. 
especially when you're under a lot of stress, even if you sleep eight, nine hours, you just, your soul feels tired. So in Jannah, there is no nasab and there is no lughub, meaning that the body and the soul will be relaxed in paradise. And this is very rare, brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes you have people who are emotionally relaxed, spiritually they're relaxed, but physically they're exhausted. And then you have people who are physically comfortable, but spiritually they're fatigued. Mentally they're fatigued. In Jannah, Allah says, the, the, the mu'mineen, they say, لا يمسنا فيها نصب ولا يمسنا فيها لغوب. Uh, with that, inshallah, we'll conclude. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطائرين. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Any uh, questions or comments? Um, for uh, in, in verse thirty-three, you gave uh, you had Quran uh, su- uh, chapter eighteen, verse thirty-one talk about the green garments of fine silk. Yeah. Uh, what what is the what is special about the garments being green? Do you know? Yeah. Now, of course, you know, green doesn't mean that everyone is literally wearing green in paradise. Uh, some some Mufassirin have, have said that, uh, that it, we could take it literally, but it's, we can also understand the verse to mean that that, that green, green symbolizes vitality and even if you look at the the spectrum of colors we know that that blue and green have calming psychological effects on on people you know that's why you know when uh you know research has, has shown that if you write if you handwrite your notes it's better to use blue ink because blue is very easy on the eyes Green is very easy on the eyes, and and so and this is just another. Uh, it it re- emphasizes this this idea that everything in paradise, from the clothes to the jewelry, is designed to maximize human comfort and relaxation. So this could be one of the the possible explanations regarding the color uh, of of green green garments. Uh, thank you. And in verse 32, um, could you talk a little bit more about, uh, is, is there a grammatical uh, explanation as well to show that the inheritors are not of the Quran are not the same as the three groups being talked about afterwards? See, the, the, the problem is grammatically, grammatically both are possible. And this is why you see uh, this difference of opinion, because grammatically both of them uh, are possible. So, so from a grammatical perspective, it can be possible. But theologically, we know that it doesn't make sense to say that then we cause to inherit the book those who we have chosen of our servants, and then th- those who Allah chooses end up wronging themselves. So, so. Th- Theologically, there, there's a problem here. Grammatically, it, uh, both, both interpretations are technically valid from a grammatical standpoint. But if you look at the, the content, the content doesn't make sense if, if you assume that those three groups refer to those who have been chosen by God. And, and, and based on the, the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, and as I, as I showed, it's not just one or two. We have many riwayat, many nar- narrations where the imams spe- specifically mention that those three groups, uh, at least two of them, are uh, categories of people based on their relationship with those who have been chosen to inherit the book. So to answer your question, grammatically, both are possible, but, but theologically and based on the content and the conclusions that you would have to make Based on what 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 inter, what, uh, what uh, how you interpret the verse is gonna is gonna affect it. 
Um, could you elaborate a little bit on what it means to be the chosen servant of Allah? So in, in this in this context, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابِ So here we know that those who are chosen, because if, if, if we say God chose them, chose them for what? They were chose to inherit. ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابِ Then we caused to inherit the book. So when Allah, so Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes chooses people for, for nubuwa, He chooses people for different, different roles. You know, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Here in this context, there is, there is an istifa, there is a choosing of people for a specific role, and that is to inherit the book, to be the recipients of the knowledge of the Quran, to inherit the understanding of the Quran. And the understanding of the Quran in its totality, not just a part of the Quran. So, so this is what it what is meant here in this context when, when we say, that these people were chosen to inherit the book. So it's uh, of the servants, some have been chosen to inherit the book, and the other three people are also other groups among the servants but not of the chosen servants exactly exactly and that's where the that's where the confusion is because both are tech are grammatically correct so so famine home so this this uh this pronoun who does it go back to it goes back to ibadina our servants it doesn't go back to the chosen servants So it's really what what does that pronoun go back to? And among see, um, even even in English, and among them, among who? Among our servants or among our chosen servants? That's where the uh, the uh, the difference of opinion arises. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. And could you uh, now clarify how um, could, we talked about how all three groups go to paradise? And so there's a question about uh, how will uh, all the groups go to paradise, if it includes, say, the Khalidin of Fitna who go to the hellfire and those are. No, again, we, we have, if, if someone truly believes in the Wilay of Ahlul Bayt, then they, they, won't, they won't end up in, uh, in hellfire. They may be punished. Now, now, someone may ask, okay, how about a, a Shi'i who commits murder? Who commits heinous crimes it's important to understand that we're talking about true belief that's in the heart you know many of many people who call themselves shias and they commit fornication and they drink it's very possible that they might die and they might lose their faith when they're on their deathbed you know so so do that's why doing good deeds is so important because so because having a proper belief system is the foundation of good deeds. So you need a proper belief system to do good deeds. And you also need good deeds to preserve your faith. So you and I might think that someone is that someone they identified as a follower of Ahlul Bayt. But let's say, God forbid, they, they drink alcohol, they fornicate, they murder, they commit cardinal sins. It's very possible that such a person may end up relinquishing their faith. So they wouldn't even fall fall into the uh, these uh, th these two groups that are are bound for paradise. So these are people who retain their iman, and to even retain your faith, you have to have done some good. It's it's almost impossible for someone to be completely wicked and have no goodness in them, and just because they profess to believe in the Ahlul Bayt, they're just gonna enter paradise. It's a lot more complicated than that, and that's why. Many people may completely lose their faith in their last moments because they've they've committed such heinous crimes, and we and we know that even intuitively, you know, even on days that on days that you commit sins, you don't you don't feel spiritual. You're you're less inclined to pray and to read du'a. So imagine, and this is this happens when we commit you know sins that are not as major as 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 murder or fornication. Imagine someone commits major sins regularly. It's very possible that they might completely turn away. So they, they wouldn't even be uh, considered a part of the, this group. 
nice. It sounds like you're highlighting a difference between thinking you believe something and actually believing it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And that's an important distinction because, because Allah doesn't care about labels. The labels that we give ourselves, it's it's about the reality. Like, you know, there are many people who who identify socially, politically as Muslims or as Shias, but there's nothing about them. They don't they don't have real belief in their hearts. So they wouldn't even be considered uh, uh, a part of this group. Uh, and in verse 31, uh, wow. you talked about how the, uh, what it says we reveal some of the book. How, uh, the scholars who say that the book refers to the Quran, how do they explain the usage of the word some? Like how did, that it's only some of the book that was revealed? So, so here men, and this is where it gets complicated because of Arabic grammar. Men is a preposition that doesn't, on, doesn't always mean from. It could mean uh, so. So men could be. It could mean from. It could mean a part. So well, well, kamil al kitab. So from doesn't mean that it doesn't mean some in this context. It means that, and to which we have revealed to you, o Muhammad, of the book, that the truth is coming from this book. It's not that some of the some of uh, that uh, that some of the truth has been revealed from the book. So So it's not that some of the book was revealed to the Prophet. That's not what it's saying. That from the truth, it doesn't mean some of the truth. So here, mean min, it does not mean a part or a sum, because min has many meanings. The preposition min has many meanings in the Arabic language. Yeah, thank you. And a follow up to the previous question. Uh, so are there some people who will remain in hellfire forever? Absolutely. There are, there are, there are many verses in the Quran that speak about uh, people who, who will remain in Jahannam for all of eternity. But there's only, a, there's only a, a certain group. And many scholars have said that this is going to be a, a minority of people. Most people, because of God's mercy and his beneficence, they will be taken out of hell and they will be admitted into paradise. And even in Dua Qumayn, uh, Allah, Allah uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib mentions that you know Allah has decreed that the stubborn, the stubborn and the rebellious will remain in in hellfire forever. Those who just who are stubborn, who refuse to concede and accept the truth. So the mu'anid, the stubborn. The perfidious rejecter is the one who is who is punished for all of eternity. But those who admit their mistakes and who pay whatever penalty God gives them, no, they, they won't be in, in hellfire forever. Because most people will be able, they have the capacity to undergo that, uh, that, that process of purification. I mean, it, it's like someone who refuses to acknowledge they made a mistake. You know, so the, the first step in in rectifying yourself is to admit that you have a problem so there are some people in jahannam who will refuse to even admit they have a problem so that that state of stubbornness uh will uh, will make them dwell in uh in the hellfire forever so it's that it's only that it's a small group that will remain thank you very much Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for uh, for your time, and we will uh, we will continue our discussion next week. Jazakumullah.